Good morning. If you have your Bibles, uh, if you could open them to the book of Exodus, um, Exodus chapter 31, Exodus chapter 31. Over the past two weeks, we've been studying in the sermons on Sunday morning about what the Bible says about the Sabbath day. We had our first lesson two weeks ago, and that lesson examined how the Old Testament limited the observance of the Sabbath day to the nation of Israel. And no other country was commanded to observe the Sabbath day, only Israel. And then last week's sermon showed how the New Testament does not in any way command Christians to observe the Sabbath day today. And so what we're going to do this morning is conclude this series of lessons on the Sabbath day by looking at some questions that people have about the Sabbath and whether Christians should consider today, Sunday, to be our Sabbath day. Uh, we're going to examine three questions this morning. The first one of them is based out of Exodus chapter 31. So let's read verses 16 and 17. Exodus 31 starting with verse 16. Now this is God talking to Moses, and he says, Therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel, that in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. So the question that many have based on this verse, and it's an understandable question. If the Sabbath is something that God does not require of anyone, Jew or Gentile, under Christianity today, then why does he say in this passage that it is a sign between him and the Jews forever? Because forever, when we think of that term, we think without end, eternity, right? Well, what we need to remember is that the Old Testament, specifically the book of Exodus, was originally written in Hebrew. The Hebrew word that is translated forever in this passage is olam. And what that word literally means is long duration, long time, long, completed time. Now, in some cases, it could be translated forever, as in eternity, but the context determines the proper definition. Keep in mind, this same word is used in Genesis chapter 17, verse 13, to describe the amount of time that circumcision would be commanded by God for the Jews to observe. In Exodus chapter 29, verse 42, this same word is used to describe the amount of time the Passover would be commanded by God for the Jews to observe. Now, a circumcision and the Passover commands that God intended for the Jewish nation to observe forever, for all eternity. The New Testament would disagree with that because the New Testament teaches that under the Christian age, those particular Jewish rites, those Jewish holy days, circumcision and Passover, are done away with. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17 make that very clear. So obviously, olam in Hebrew, which is translated forever, olam does not mean forever when it comes to circumcision. It does not mean forever when it comes to the Passover. What it rather means is what the Hebrew word means, for a long time, for a long completed time. In other words, God told Abraham in Genesis 17 that his descendants would be observing circumcision for a very long time until it was completed. In Exodus 29, he told the Jews that you would be observing the Passover for a very long time until it was completed. And in like manner, Olam means the same day for the Sabbath day. Here in Exodus chapter 31, what God is telling Israel is that I intend for the Sabbath to be a sign between me and you, Israel, for a long time, for a long duration, for a long time that would eventually be completed. Now, 
from Sinai when he gave that command for the Sabbath day all the way to when Jesus died on the cross when There are many, many centuries between Sinai and Calvary. And so when he is saying here in the original Hebrew, this is a sign, the Sabbath is a sign between me and you Jews for a very long time until it is completed, that's exactly what happened. It was something that was observed for centuries. So the answer to the question, if Sabbath is something that God does not require of anyone under Christianity, why does he say here that it is a sign between him and the Jews forever? The answer to that question is, forever does not mean eternity here. Forever means for a very, very long time until it's completed. And that's exactly what the Bible teaches about the Sabbath. Here's the next question that people have about the Sabbath. Was there a day that God told Christians to set aside in the New Testament? In the Old Testament, he told the Jews to set aside the seventh day of the week as a Sabbath day, a day of rest. Is there a day that God told Christians to set aside in the New Testament? That's a very important question because 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6 says that we are not to go beyond what is written. Revelation 20 verses 18 and 19 say that we are not to add to or take away from the word of God in any way. So in the New Testament, which is the covenant, the law that we are under as Christians, there are only two mentions of a day that has any sort of special significance for Christians. Go to Acts chapter 20 verse 7. In Acts chapter 20 verse 7 it says, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, and then it went on to say that he prolonged his speech until midnight. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, look at verse 2. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 2, it says, On the first day of the week, literally in the Greek, on the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper. And then look also at Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10 where the Apostle, Paul, uh, the Apostle John while in exile on Patmos he said I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. He mentions the Lord's day. Now historical writings outside of the Bible show that in that time period when John was alive Christians at that time called the first day of the week the Lord's day. So the New Testament mentions the first day of the week as Acts 20 verse 7, the day that the disciples came together to break bread. And what breaking bread is a reference to is communion, the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 16 and 17, it, Paul asked Christians, the bread which we break, is it not a communion between you and the body of Christ? So on the first day of the week, Acts chapter 20 verse 7, the disciples gathered together to break bread, to partake of communion. And while they were there, they heard preaching, because it says that Paul preached to them until midnight, Acts 20, verse 7. We also read in 1 Corinthians 16, verse, verse 2, on the first day of every week, Christians, you are to lay by in store, you are to give of, the, of your means, as we did a few minutes ago today. So if we are not to go beyond what is written in Scripture, as the Bible says we are not to do, if we are not to add to God's word or take away from it, then what day of the week do we as Christians set aside as significant? It is the first day of the week. Now hi history shows that the early Christians understood this. That the early Christians set aside the first day of the week as a day of worship. Revelation was the last book of the Bible to be written. It was written in A.D. 97, towards the very end of the first century A.D. Just a few years later, in the year 100 A.D., there was a Christian by the name of Barnabas. He wrote a letter that, de that described to the Roman authorities what Christianity is all about. It's called the Epistle of Barnabas. And here's what he says in the Epistle of Barnabas in the year 100 A.D., just a few years after the Bible was completed. 
he says, we keep the eighth day with joyfulness, the day also on which Jesus rose again from the dead. The eighth day. Well, what's the eighth day? If there are seven days of the week and Saturday is the seventh day, then what would be the eighth day? It would be the first day of the following week. It would be Sunday. And we know from the Bible accounts, from the Gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all mention that Jesus rose again on the first day of the week. What did this early Christian write to Rome? He said, we Christians, what do we do? We keep the eighth day, or the first day of the week, Sunday, with joyfulness. There's another Christian by the name of John, Justin Martyr. And he was one of the Apostle John's disciples, according to what history tells us. Justin Martyr, in the year 150 A.D., so this is just a little more than half a century after the New Testament was completed, in the year 150 A.D., he also wrote to the Roman authorities describing what Christianity was all about. Here's what he wrote. And on the day called Sunday... All who live in cities or in the country gather together to one place, and the memoirs of the apostles or the writings of the prophets are read as long as time permits. He went on to say, But Sunday is the day on which we all hold our common assembly, because it is the first day on which God, having wrought a change in the darkness and matter, made the world, and Jesus Christ our Savior on the same day rose from the dead. So you have testimony from Christians who were living in that same time period that they considered the Lord's day to be the first day of the week. That on the first day of the week, that was the day that they had set aside to assemble together to worship God, partake of communion, and give of their means. Various encyclopedias and history books also record that from the beginning, Christians gathered together to worship on the first day of the week. Now as we've seen... Most early Christians did not observe the Sabbath. Now, some Jewish Christians continued to observe the Sabbath, but pretty much all the Gentile Christians in that first century did not. Now, as time went on, gradually, less and less Jewish Christians observed the Sabbath day because they began to be taught correctly that the Sabbath was not... Um, something that the Lord commanded for them under the New Covenant. Unfortunately, however, as time went on, many began to view the Lord's Day, Sunday, as the Christian Sabbath, the Christian Day of Rest. During the 4th, 5th, and 6th centuries A.D., there was a lot of controversy over whether Christians should keep the Sabbath on Saturday. Some wanted to make both Sat uh, they wanted to make both the Sabbath Saturday and the Lord's Day Sunday. They wanted to make both of them holy days. Others, especially the Puritans, began to call Sunday, the Lord's Day, the Christian Sabbath. And today, many Catholics and many Protestants routinely refer to Sunday as the Sabbath. And that brings us to the last question that we're going to answer this morning and in this series. Is Sunday the Christian Sabbath? What does the Bible say about it? In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 11, it says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. Oracle means spokesperson. If anyone speaks, we are to speak as God would speak. We are to be God's spokespeople. In other words, if the Bible is God's word, and we are to speak on behalf of God, speak as God would speak, be oracles, then we must call Bible things by Bible names. We must call, we must use biblical terms that God originally used to refer to the same things that God referred to. Now we've seen in this series that the word Sabbath, literally in the Hebrew, Shabbat, that originally meant in, uh, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, to rest. Sabbath means rest, to rest from labor. We've also seen that under the Old Testament, this word Shabbat, rest, Sabbath, was applied to a day, the seventh day of the week. But we've also seen that under the New Testament, this word is not applied to any day. 
Nowhere in the New Testament is the first day of the week commanded by God to be a day of rest. It is commanded to be a day of worship, but it's not commanded to be a day of rest from working. Now, you know, when I am excited about the VAC that we're doing on Sunday afternoons now, the outreach. There is one downside to it. I don't have time for my Sunday afternoon nap anymore. I, that, that is something that I will miss, my Sunday afternoon nap. I, will, I am more than happy to take a Sabbath, a rest, on Sundays in the afternoon. I'm more, more than happy to make every day a Sabbath, a day of rest for me. I would love that. I think many of you would too. But in the, in the Bible, in the New Testament, the word Sabbath, meaning rest, is not applied or commanded of any day as it was in the Old Testament. Uh, the, the first day of the week is commanded in the New Testament to be a day of worship, not a day of rest from working. It is completely up to us whether or not we work on that day. So why do we call it that? Why call Sunday the, the name that the Jews called Saturday when God does not intend for it to be that. There are basically three views of the Sabbath. There is the Seventh-day Adventist view, that Saturday is the Sabbath today and should be kept as a day of rest by Christians. And the Seventh-day Adventists are correct to say that God called the seventh day a Sabbath, a day of rest, but they are incorrect to say that God wants Christians to observe the Sabbath as the Jews did. But then there's another view, the Sunday Sabbath view, that Sunday is the Sabbath and should be kept by Christians. Most Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches hold to this. But they are wrong to call Sunday the Christian Sabbath, even though they are correct to teach that Christians should assemble to worship on Sunday, the first day of the week. So there's that view. But then there is the biblical view, the correct view, and here's what that is. That Saturday was the Sabbath, the day of rest in the Old Testament. The Christians in the New Testament are not obligated to keep it. And this view is held by all who respect the Bible, as found in the Old and New Testaments. But with that said, let me close by pointing out one more thing. Go to the book of Hebrews chapter 4. The New Testament does speak of a rat, of a rest, and when I say rest in the original Greek, sabbatismos, it's a derivative of the Greek sabaton, which means to rest from labor. The New Testament does speak of a rest in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. I'd like for us to read verses 1 through 11. Hebrews 4. For while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us, Christians, just as it did to them, the Old Testament Israelites. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed enter that rest as he has said, as I swore in my wrath they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken somewhere of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, They shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news failed to enter because of disobedience, again he appoints a certain day, today saying through David so long afterwards, in the words already quoted, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. Notice verse 9. So then there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God rest has also rested from his works as God did from him. Now look again at verse 9. At my, the ESV that I use, it says that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. Keep in mind that in the original language, the word Sabbath does not refer to a day. It literally means to rest from labor. 
the writer of Hebrews is not talking about a weekly rest on the seventh day of every week instituted for Israel through Moses. What he's talking about, if you read the entire passage, is a heavenly rest provided by Jesus to all of us. And if we are to enter that rest, eternity that requires diligence on our part to enter if we truly wish to enter our sabbath rest which is not on a particular day of the week here on earth but rather is in heaven for all eternity then we need to be diligent the last passage i'd like for us to read is second peter chapter 3 verses 9 through 14 we need to strive to obey what God commands us to do in this passage. 2 Peter 3, verses 9 through 14. It says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness, waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn? But according to his promise, we are waiting for new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, notice this. Since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Is that what we're doing? Is that what you are doing? Being diligent to be found by Christ on the day He comes back, the day in which that eternal Sabbath, that eternal rest will begin. Are you and I doing our best to be found by Him, to be at peace, without spot, without blemish? What we've seen in this series on the Sabbath, the word Sabbath literally means to rest from labors. In the Old Testament, it was used to describe the seventh day of the week because God wanted the Jews to observe the seventh day of the week as a holy day of rest that started at Mount Sinai and it continued all the way up until the law of Moses. In the New Testament, the word Sabbath is used to describe our eternal reward in heaven that we must be diligently striving towards in all, at all times. God never commanded nor intended for Christians to observe the seventh day as a Sabbath day. If you teach otherwise, you are teaching falsehood. God never called the first day of the week, Sunday, a Sabbath day, a day of rest. He referred to it only as the day of worship. To refer to it as anything else is to proclaim something which is not true. In, these, in this series of lessons, these three sermons, I know we've covered a lot. I appreciate your patience. I hope that you have paid attention. I hope that you will be able to tell the truth about the Sabbath to those you know who believe some or all of the falsehoods that we've gone over about it during these three weeks. Because if you are able to do that, that will open up doors for the gospel to be proclaimed and receive. And that's what God wants every Christian in this room to do. So I hope each of us will take his commandments about evangelism and being prepared to answer questions that are asked of us. I hope all of us will take those commands to heart. What I've done in these sermons, I've done my part in teaching you what the Bible says about this subject. You've done your part, and I appreciate that. Your part was to listen attentively, and I thank you for doing that. Your part now is to study more on this so that you will be prepared to teach it to others. Let's get to work and do just that. Again, I ask that question. Are you prepared to enter the eternal Sabbath in heaven that God is waiting to give to each and every one of us? If you as a Christian... to do so now as we stand and sing this song. If you are a not a Christian, 
and you want to become one through obeying the gospel, through faith, repentance, and baptism, we give you that opportunity to do so now. Please come while we stand and sing.